Hello, and welcome back to another episode of One of Us is Talking. I am here today with a very special guest, Karen McManus, the author of One of Us is One of Us is Lying, One of Us is Next, and One of Us is Back, as well as many other great thriller books. Karen, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much. So One of Us is Back is coming out in a few days. That is so exciting. I have had a chance to read the book and I have to say as a longtime fan, loved it. And Yay. <laughs> I, I mean, I thought it was just such a perfect ending for these characters. And one thing that I thought was so interesting was the point of views that you decided to go with. So we hear yeah. from Addie, Nate, and Phoebe in One of Us is Back. Why did you choose to make the books from their point of view or the book from their point of view? You know, it was such a hard choice because at this point, there's a lot of characters to choose from. And I love them all. Um, they're all compelling in their own way. But ultimately, anytime you're going to decide to have multiple points of view, the characters who are involved have to have something at stake. Um, you know, there has to be a reason that they're the ones telling the story. And so for this particular story, these were the characters who I felt had the most to like gain or lose by this segment of the mystery. Um, and so obviously that would include Phoebe because I left her on a pretty big cliffhanger, you know, at the end of <laughs> One of Us is Next. You know, the readers know that she's hiding something. And if we're not inside of her head for the third book, that is a frustrating exercise for the reader to wait for the others the other characters to catch up to Phoebe, you know, so she's, yeah. she's got to be there. Um, Addie has to be there for spoilery reasons you know, <laughs> because she has a lot at stake in this book. Um, but the third character, I think, could have gone a few different ways. And one of the reasons I chose Nate, you know, partly because I know he's a fan favorite and I knew people would enjoy hearing from him. And I also love to write him. Like, I, I felt like I, I would be sad if I miss the opportunity to tell more of a story from Nate's point of view because he's such a joy to write but I also felt like of all the characters especially the original four characters he had come such a long way but he still had the furthest to go you know Nate's future is still very much up in the air he still has a lot of internal growth to go through and I was interested in exploring that with him on the page yeah, definitely. And I mean, all the characters, they read so well, but you can tell like Nate's kind of headspace, it just flows so perfectly and naturally. And I can tell how that's your favorite to write because I think Nate just comes across as so, I don't know, he's very endearing, even if he's not in the moment, like he's kind of I, rough around the edges. Yeah, I tell people all the time that like, Nate writes himself he makes my job so easy. I sit down, I'm like, okay, Nate, do your thing. And <laughs> next thing I know, the chapter's over. And that's a very unique experience. Yeah. And these characters, I mean, the three of them were so crucial in this new mystery that you brought into the book. And I had read that this was supposed to be kind of in the original book. It was like the threads were there. So how did you bring in this mystery and keep your original idea and explore these characters, but you fit it into one of us is back so seamlessly? Yeah, that's, that is what happened. You know, it's interesting at heart. I am a standalone writer. That's how I wrote one of us is lying. That's what I intended it to be. <laughs> um, but obviously it took on a life of its own. And the next thing I know I'm writing a sequel and I finished that and I thought, okay, yeah, that was, that was good. I'm, I'm done with that. Um, and again, I didn't necessarily think I would go back to the series, but it, it keeps pulling me in. You know? <laughs> and one of the things that was always in my mind is the fact that I never fully told the complete story in One of Us is Lying because there was a plot thread and it was a pretty substantial plot thread in my very first draft that explained why, you know, our antagonists, one of them in particular, do what they do. And I thought it was absolutely crucial to understanding their role but it was very distracting. 
Um, and my agent pointed that out as soon as she signed me. It was the one thing she thought should change. And I said, okay, but how will people know why this person did what they did? And she is very wise and said, well, you just need to make them into the kind of person who would. Um, and it was brilliant advice, I thought. And it really tightened up the book and kept the focus where it needed to be. But that thread has always been in the back of my mind. And when I started thinking, I miss these characters. Is, this, is there more to tell? Is there one more book? I thought, is there a way I can go back to that um, and, and explain, you know, kind of the genesis of what happened in the first book? And ultimately, that's what One of Us is Back does. Yeah. And without being too spoilery, I have to say the way that was done was so great. Being able to kind of separate it from the main story, but it was just done in such a great way. And I mean, one thing that really sets one of us is back apart from any of your other books is there's not over nine characters that you were <laughs> basically writing for, because even if it wasn't their point of view, how did you write for nine plus characters in one book? <laughs> it was that was it was a challenge for sure and um but it was a fun challenge what I love about these books is how the universe has grown over time like I love my original four um but I also love the fact that they're not alone in this universe you know that it keeps expanding and growing more perspectives come in you know side characters who seem unimportant at first become more important and they have their their own stories you know they have their own reasons for being involved in this it's not just because <clears throat> they're Maeve's boyfriend or you know they're Bronwyn's friend there are other things that are happening with all of them and so that was what I really wanted to do was give everybody a moment to shine because if there's one thing I have learned from interacting with readers <laughs> over the past like seven plus years you know everybody has a favorite um, and their favorite is not necessarily a point of view character, you know, um, and there are reasons behind why a certain character resonates with certain readers. And I wanted to showcase each and every character. So it was a lot of juggling. <laughs> <laughs> because I even think the characters, like you said, that weren't the point of view characters, we still got so much of all of them. So we really still get to see this Bayview crew out and about. And I think everyone's favorite character does get their moment to shine. I hope so. Thank goodness it was summer, you know. Thank goodness that timing worked out because I could yeah. never have brought them all <laughs> together otherwise. No, exactly. And the summer was a great setting for the story. And how do you think One of Us's Back differs from One of Us is Lying and One of Us is Next? I think it's still like the same heart of the world. Like it's yeah. still there, but it definitely did have a different feel to it. I think with this book, you know, characters have been trying to move on for a while <laughs> and, and they've been successful <laughs> in a lot of ways, right? I mean, people we're starting to see the shape of their future, you know, and that's exciting. And we're seeing their relationships grow and develop. Um, but they can't quite get out from under Simon's legacy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what this book is starting to address, is that there are just some far-reaching ramifications and ripple effects that, that really weren't, um, weren't ever fully put to rest. And if these characters are truly going to become the people that they're meant to be and have the lives that they're meant to be, you know, they've got to go in one more time. Yes. <laughs> and I think that they didn't even themselves realize kind of the effects of Simon that kind of was left over. I think that's something they learned throughout the book. And I know this book was dedicated to the readers, but it just felt like such a love letter for the fans. Since you published One of Us is Lying in 2017, have you had any memorable fan interactions? Oh, yeah, so many. Um, I think the first thing, <clears throat> excuse me, that really kind of struck me that this book was so much bigger than me or anything I had ever expected. It was probably like way back in early 2018 when I was still on Twitter, you know, checking <laughs> notifications. And I saw 
Bronwyn Rojas followed you. And I was like, what? <laughs> and that was the first of many, you know, fan accounts that were, that used the names of my characters or posted like my characters. And I thought, oh, wow, like people are just taking these characters to a whole new level. You know, they're imagining their lives outside of the book. And I thought that was just magical. And then um, I think later that year, one of my book events, I saw, you know, the loveliest young woman who had short purple hair. And she told me she did that because of Addie, because she'd never identified with the character so much. Oh. And that really, it, I mean, it's going to make me like cry a little bit now, yeah. but it, it, it make me tear up. Yeah, no, seeing how people react to these characters, I can only imagine how that is for you. Someone who's seen them from the very start when you first started writing them all the way to now and they're just such beloved characters and in the literary world and I mean this kind of go my next question kind of goes off this Nate Wynn has become such a beloved <laughs> and <laughs> iconic couple when you first wrote them did you see it going in that direction did you expect this for them you know it's funny I mean the on the one hand you can never expect something like this, right? Um, especially with your first book, because at the time I was writing these characters, I did not have an agent. So obviously I did not have a publisher. Yeah. You know, there was, <laughs> I had written two other books that went nowhere. So the odds were good that this book would also go nowhere. Um, and yet at the same time, when I was sharing early drafts with beta readers and critique partners, I had never had this kind of reaction, you know, to the book in general, um, but to Nate and Bronwyn in particular. And um, have you ever read the book um, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow? I have not, but it's on my list. Of it's, it's amazing. I, like definitely move it to the top of your list because it's so good. You know, it's about these video game designers um, it follows their their lives and their friendship. And at one point in the book, they developed their very first game and it's gonna go on to become a monster hit. And one of the characters says to the other, I think we really have something here. And that was like literally what I said to my sister about, about one of us is lying. I was like, I think I really have something here. Like you can feel it when mm -hmm. something you cr created is, is has this all of this unmet potential. But what you don't know is if it's ever going to be realized. And I think that was the the truly exciting part was to put these characters out into the world, you know, with a publisher who understood the vision and cared about them as much as I did. And then to have readers feel the same way. Yeah, I think Nate Wynn definitely, they're going to carry on. And I think all <laughs> the characters will, but like just such a legacy of this book. And I think it's one of those couples that, readers who read the book now are going to look back and be like oh my god I love them and then as the years go on this book with them is just going to become such like a classic kind of young adult literature so I mean I love them and I <laughs> that's my favorite trope like the good girl bad boy but they were just there's something about them we always say we don't know what you put in Nate Wynn because they're like <laughs> <laughs> they just and, insane. <laughs> yeah, and they are tropey, you know, it's like 100% a trope that I personally enjoy and tropes exist for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Because people like them. Um, and I don't know what the secret sauce is behind Nate Wynn. Um, but I do think what I hear from people is that they feel real. Um, you know, they don't feel, they might start out like stereotypes in a stereotypical trophy relationship, but that's not ultimately where they end up. And, and that's how I feel when I write them. Like these are fleshed out true people who are genuinely connected to one another. Yeah. And kind of like how you had mentioned before, like people picturing their life outside of the world of the books. I think that's something that makes them so real. We can all picture that for them. So even yeah. if it's not like explicitly in the book, you can just visualize their world outside. So I think that's such a great aspect of them. And in One of Us is Back, with again, without spoilers, some minor characters from the first book ended up playing a bigger role. That was one of my favorite parts. <laughs> so what was it like writing for those characters that, had to make like 
a reappearance and they were much bigger than before. Well, I think it's, you know, it's not a spoiler to say that, you know, we get to see a lot more of Vanessa, um, who was such a fun character to write. And I had wanted to write her into One of Us is Next. You know, I always felt like there was more to Vanessa's story than I got to tell in the first book. Um, but she, she didn't fit there. It didn't make sense. But it really worked for this overarching theme of the third book in that everyone is trying to move on and nobody can. <laughs> and she is 100% one of those people who is kind of stuck in that cycle of who she was in high school. So it was really interesting to bring her in. She was super fun to write. You know, she has a lot of scenes with Nate and I had a great time playing those two off one another. Yeah, no, they were great interactions. And I remember when I was first reading it and I saw her name, I was like, when actually when I opened the book and she was kind of in like the character index, I'm like, okay, maybe she'll just be thrown in. But she played a big part and she was, honestly phenomenal so I think that was a great addition into Good. the story and I'm so excited for other fans to read that and see their reaction and this story was just so complex I know <laughs> <laughs> as a writer I always do that to myself <laughs> <laughs> it was so complex and as a writer one of my biggest I guess issues I would say is mapping it out and getting the direction. So you had this complex storyline. How did you start mapping it out and planning the direction you wanted to go in? It doesn't usually start as complex as it ends. You know, with my mysteries, I know the big mystery. You know, I know like the who done it and the why done it. And then I start mapping out, okay, how do I get there? And I never want it to be a straight line. You know, and, and for me, the way to avoid a straight line is usually to toss in a few sub mysteries. You know, there's a few other things going on and they obscure the reality of the big picture. They distract us. Um, and ideally, they feed into it, too, though, you know, so everything is related at the end. And that's the kind of thing that it's, it's hard to see it all at once. You know, you kind of have to do it piece by piece, brick by brick, write a few chapters, think about where you are, how has the story changed, um, where can it go? And I usually surprise myself a couple of times as I'm outlining even, even before I start to write. And I feel like that's a good thing because if I can surprise myself, then hopefully I can surprise readers too. Yeah, no, I mean, I even think the character's ending came not as a surprise to me, but I think I was surprised with how perfect it was for all of them and it nicely wrapped up. And one thing that was different from One of Us is Lying is that there was no epilogue in this book. So is that, was the ending for them, was that decision kind of to cut out the epilogue because you felt that it was right for them where they were? You know, it's funny because there almost was an epilogue um, and it was actually going to be 10 years down the road because like I have always known where these characters are at every stage of their life when they're 28, when they're 38, you know, and, and so on. And so part of me wanted to share that with readers, you know, and say, here's here it is. Here they are mm -hmm. as adults and this is their lives. Um but then I, I wrote the ending that I wrote with them in the present day. And I just thought, you know what? I feel like that's right. I think it maybe it would feel too prescriptive to go into the future and say, you know, stake in the ground. This is where everybody is. Because again, I feel like readers like to do that. You know, they mm -hmm. like to take um, parts of the story and, and spin out their own alternate universes. And I think that's great. I think I've given you enough to have a pretty solid sense yeah. of what the rest of each character's life is going to be like. And, um, and you can imagine whatever you want. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely the beauty of it, because I know where I see the characters now 10 years down the road. And that might not be the same as how you would see it or another reader would see it. But I think we have the good idea of kind of where they would be and it would all be similar. And we kind of talked about how Nate is the easiest to write for. He just writes himself. But are there any characters that are the hardest to write for? 
I mean, I always found Cooper hard to write for in the first book, um, just because he is the character who's kind of the least honest with himself, at least initially. Mm -hmm. um, and so to try and write a character who feels true because you're you're in his head, you know, you want readers to trust him and to relate to him, but to also make it clear that he's struggling and that we're not seeing the full picture of who he is. That was always like a really delicate balance to write. Um, and I think Phoebe was hard to write too. And in particular, just because she has such a contentious relationship with her sister. And I love to write siblings. Um, you know, I loved writing Bronwyn and Maeve. I loved writing Bryn and Ellie in my latest book, Nothing More to Tell. I love super close sisters because I'm close to my sister. And there was just so many times I had to, you know, stop writing because I realized I was trying to put those two together and they can't be together. And I would just have to wait and <laughs> let the impulse pass and then write a relationship that was more true to those two. Yeah, because that was definitely a different sister relationship than you really have ever covered before in any of your books. So it was kind of interesting to yeah, see how they they're usually that. partners you know my yeah. my my sisters are partners they look out for each other and that was my one of my absolute favorite things about writing Bronwyn and Maeve and it is still is um mm -hmm. I adore those two it's it's much harder for me to write a contentious relationship where they're lying to one another they're not supporting each other they're not looking out for each other and um and having that make sense from a character perspective yeah, definitely. And I'm not sure if you can say anything on this, but are there any cut chapters or lines or scenes per se from the book that doesn't make it in that you can talk about? Or does usually everything that you kind of plan out, especially now that you've been doing this for a while, make it into the book? Yeah, you know, the thing about me is I'm a really lean writer. So my first drafts are always much, much shorter than the final book. They're almost like a screenplay. It's just like dialogue you know, and a little <laughs> bit of action. And so I almost never cut, I add. Um, and if I cut, it's because something's not working, you know, and it's funny because mm -hmm. publishers are always saying, oh, do you have a deleted scene we can use for a special edition of the book? And I'm like, no, <laughs> because I deleted it because it was terrible. Uh, otherwise, I would absolutely keep it and expand on it because that's typically what I do as I revise. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I guess this wasn't originally a cut chapter or anything, but getting that prom scene with our Bayview yes. Ford and their friends. That was, I love that. So that was so fun to see them there. I wrote that during COVID because I needed to cheer myself up. Um, and at the time I thought, oh, maybe I'll do something with this. I was, I was going to maybe write it from everyone's perspective. And then I thought I'll, I'll share it. Um, and then I got busy and I didn't do it, but somebody asked me, I think it was on Twitter, if Nate and Brown ever went to prom. And I thought, you know what, I'm, it's not done, but I'm going to answer that question and I'm going to show you how. <laughs> it's funny, actually, because that was one of my good friends. What had happened was, is the day before she had asked, my brother went to prom. So I'm like watching this all unfold. And I'm like, I wonder if they ever went to prom together. And then my one friend's like, I'm going to ask. And then we ended up getting the whole <laughs> scene of it. So it was, it was so funny. Cause I'm like, I just had like this little thought about it. And then we're like, let's just see what happens. And my friend's like, I'll ask, let's see. And we ended up getting such a great scene out of it. I was like, as it turns out, <laughs> they did seven pages on. about prom. <laughs> <laughs> so that was so great to see. And I know for that first book and second, well, all your books, some of them on Spotify, you have playlists. So when you were writing One of Us is Back, are there any songs that helped you get some inspiration for the characters or the plot? Yeah, one of them, um, I do have a playlist for that book. I think it might be on Spotify. I don't know if it's public. Sometimes I, I keep them quiet while I'm writing just because mm -hmm. I feel like it's just for me. And also it might change when <laughs> the book is done. <laughs> and I realize that song doesn't fit after all. But one of the songs that was on there that I listened to a lot was Taylor Swift, Look What You Made Me Do, because it just fits 
so many like, characters like so well <laughs> and, and okay? also kind of fits that theme of you know are you taking accountability or are you blaming you know and looking for somebody to scapegoat yeah that's a good one are you a taylor fan i'm such a taylor fan her <laughs> songs are almost always on my playlists love that yeah no same here and I love a, a lot of like the one of us is lying fans are all also Taylor fans so like a lot of her songs make it into edits or like scene parallels with the book so that's always so fun to see I um, love that I think Taylor is a master storyteller you know she just uses a different format than yeah. I do yeah no it's so great and yeah, her songs, I mean, just really relate to the characters. And I have to ask, do you have a favorite song off of Midnight's? Oh my God. I don't think I could pick, honestly. <laughs> all... <laughs> I'm right there with you. So <laughs> I just had to ask, but I mean, this was the final book. So I feel like they're of the one of us is lying world. So I feel like there was a lot maybe of personal stakes with it or maybe challenges? Are there any challenges you can talk about that you faced while writing the book? You know, honestly, it was a joy to write. It was a joy to come back to the characters. And it was, it had its challenges plot wise, but all books do. I think the thing that surprised me or that was different about this book is that when I finished I was really emotional. I cried and I I don't usually do that. Um, I, I always feel like a little bit bereft, you know, a little bit maybe even lonely because um, I'm saying goodbye to the people who've been living in my head for a while, but I, I never just sort of broke down in tears. And um, I think it just speaks to how important these characters were to me also. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they changed my life. You know? <laughs> and um, I've been living with them for a really long time. And I've seen them kind of spin off into the world in a lot of different ways. Um, and it's been an amazing ride. And so to kind of close that chapter, it, it definitely hit me. It hit me hard. Yeah, I mean, I know the ending. And I think the character whose point of view it ended on was so perfect. Um, this book found me during quarantine, one of us is lying. So it was just, you know, how quarantine was for everyone. It wasn't a great time. It was those first days in 2020 and they've became such a comforting group to me. So I think even as a reader finishing, it was very like, oh my goodness, it was so emotional. And it ended on such a good note for everyone that I just think, it really lived up to the expectations that I'm so glad. I you know, that's that's really all I want is for readers to feel like I did the characters justice and that I told a good story and that it was worth your time in the end. Yeah, no, they were great. And oh my, I could not put the book down. I was literally at the gym on the treadmill reading it. Like, like <laughs> <laughs> it just caught me so much. I loved it. And I mean so much of your writing I'm sure too ooh, sorry about that has prop has probably grown since you first started so if you could go back to your very first draft of one of us is lying what advice would you give to yourself you know I honestly don't know if I would want to change my mindset at all because part of the beauty of writing that book is that I wrote it for myself or I wrote it for like the teenage version of me, you know, mm -hmm. it was exactly the kind of book that I would have liked to read. And in my previous two books, I'd kind of been chasing trends. I was like, oh, dystopian is big. I'm going to write that. Turns out it was not big anymore, but I didn't know that. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, fantasy is big. I'll write that. And neither of those books really worked out. And and this time, I I didn't think, oh, thrillers are big because they really weren't at the time. It was it was a quieter um, genre um, right then. I just thought I'm I'm gonna write the book that teenage Karen would have loved to read, and let's see where it takes me. And I think had I known that book would go on to do what it did and you know sell millions of copies I might have been intimidated and maybe the book would be less raw and less emotional and less honest um and I think that's what people respond to 
Yeah, that's actually a very interesting point of view because you do have some people that say, go back and change this. But hearing that, it is interesting, especially because I don't, I think like you said, it just, it would have been so intimidating because I think that would have created more pressure if you knew what was set out for it. Yeah, it was a very pure experience. Um, And your first published book, always is you know after that there are voices in your head and they're good voices you know you want an editor you want an agent you want readers you want reviewers um but it it gets it's a challenge to tune it out um and there were just no challenges with that book it was just like here we go okay characters <laughs> pretty taken me and it was a, a really lovely ride so so yeah i wouldn't change it it's something i treasure i treasure the memory of that time writing it i really do Yeah. And I think even how you mentioned that thrillers weren't really popular when this book kind of started, that's so true. And I think One of Us is Lying really kind of set the stage in a way for young adult thrillers, especially. I feel like it helped. Um, and that's something I'm I'm really happy about because I've always loved thrillers and there, there have been some great ones. Um, you know, We Were Liars was very popular and that was one of my comps and I loved that book. Um, but I think like the depth and the breadth and the diversity that we see now on the shelves for thrillers, um, I do think One of Us is Lying helped with that um, because it was such an unexpected success. And whenever that happens, publishers are like, okay, let's do it again. (laughs) So I think it did help open some doors and I'm really happy about that. Yeah, no, I love why thrillers. So it's great to hear that. And I mean, kind of you're our queen of why thrillers. So what's up next for you after this book release? Are there any future releases planned you can talk about yet? Well, I am currently revising my eighth book. Um, so that is going to come out probably summer 2024 and it's a standalone thriller and it is the most complicated book I have ever written. I said earlier, like, why do I do this to myself? I'm really (laughs) asking that with this book. It's giving me fits, but, um, but it's a lot of fun too. And after that, we will see, I don't have anything lined up and I might kind of take a beat and give myself a little break. (laughs) A well-deserved break. (laughs) I've been doing a book a year for eight years and it's been awesome, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ready to have more conversations with people outside of my head than, than inside of it. I think that could be nice for a beat. Yes. Well, that's a very deserved break and very excited for your future release in summer 2024. Hopefully we'll be checking nonstop for updates on that. And yeah, I mean, one of us is lying, one of us is next, and one of us is back. I think it's really just a trilogy that plays out and you get to meet all these characters. And this last book, I'm so excited for other people to read. Are you nervous at all to have this book kind of go out to the world? A little bit. Um I never want to disappoint readers, you know, and I know that a lot of people are looking forward to it. And, you know, I hope that they have fun with it. That's really all that I hope. And I know that you can't please everybody. Um, But I really did try to think about the characters and what they deserved um, in terms of having their stories put into the world for a third and final time. (laughs) So I hope that I got there and I hope that people enjoy the ride. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm so excited for the release of the book and I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me.